Well, let's go ahead and get started. And I'll just keep an eye on, on the waiting room um, to make sure I let everybody in. So um, thank you so much again. My name is Elisa Strada. I'm the Senior Director for PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. I am located in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and please let us know where you are right now. Uh, there is a beautiful um, sunset happening or soon to be sunset happening where I am. I hope it's the same near you. Um, but I'm so happy to be here with Anne Davenport, who is a senior arts and culture producer at the News Hour. And we are going to be hearing so much about her experience, her wisdom, and hoping to help a lot of you who are currently working on pieces for student reporting labs for our art and social change prompt. Um, so tonight we are going to learn a lot from Anne, as I just mentioned. And um, we're also gonna be getting a lot of tips and feedback. So some of you have shared your rough cuts, your pitches, your scripts with us, uh, which we're so happy to go through and to watch. So we're gonna be talking about those. I'm gonna be asking those students who uh, are here and whose pieces we're gonna be talking about to at the uh, right time unmute and, and share a little bit about yourselves, but we'll get to that. Um, in a little bit. And then I hope that you come away inspired and energized to finish your stories strong. Um, and, you know, hopefully with more inspiration to also just think differently about um, the pieces that you're producing now and hopefully in the future as well. Um, and I also wanted to um, remind everybody that this is, this is a workshop. So we're hoping that um, we're here to support each other's ideas, each other's stories, and provide helpful tips and feedback. Um, so in that spirit, I just want to remind everybody that this room uh, and everybody in this room is expected to be kind and respectful, um, and that if uh, you are not speaking, that you can stay on mute. Um, and then when we do call on you, um, feel free to unmute and then share. Um, so just some reminders for the conversation. And now a little bit more about uh, why we're here. So many of you have submitted stories for our In Social Change prompt. I added here a link and a screenshot of what the prompt looks like on Storymaker. You may have found it through here, you may have found it another way, but um, the challenge for this project was to produce a feature story about art and social change in your community. Um, and so we have, uh, we've gotten a lot and um, that's why we're excited to talk about it today with Anne Davenport. Um, so I uh, would love to now officially introduce Anne. Welcome Anne um, to you. our session tonight. We're so happy that you're here and I'm actually gonna also pin you and pin myself so that everybody can see us. Um, so Anne, uh, tell us a little bit about your own journey. Tell us your story first before we get into other, other students' stories. How did you get to where you are now reporting on arts and culture pieces for the news hour? Um, thank you. First off, I'm really excited to do this. I consider myself one of the people who's been rooting on SRL from its very earliest days, a colleague and friend of Leah Clapman's and always a huge fan of SRL. Um, so thanks for having me. So I would say, uh, in a way, uh, accidental um, producer of arts. It's not what I started out doing, but it's what I love doing. Um, and hopefully that'll come through in my work. And uh, I would encourage anyone who is thinking about pursuing arts coverage to absolutely do it. It's really, as we define it, another way to look at the news of the day. Uh, after all, all of my pieces are airing on a national nightly newscast. So we always say it is news. It's bottom of the fold news. If you think of a newspaper, that's an old term or back of the book as we call it, but it is news. So we, uh, it's a side door into same, some of the same social issues that are uh, probed, um, you know, earlier on in the broadcast, but we get at those things. And sometimes we um, create a little bit of levity and there's nothing wrong with that or, you know, some solace in tough times uh, through some of our Ukrainian coverage, I would say. So um, um, that's all to the good. So in terms of how I got to it, um, I was a one person band or one man band um, shooting and editing my own political stories in Iowa during uh, the caucus of 1988, straight out of school, I moved from Providence, Rhode Island, where I went to college, to Sioux City, had never um, reported or lived in the Midwest, took a sleeping bag, it was 
really a pretty big plunge for me. And to learn how to shoot and edit was something I needed and wanted to do. And a news director was willing to teach me. I did not have those technical skills. I had been a political science major um, at Brown University. And, and um, so I had always been involved in journalism, running a daily independent paper at college and radio and had worked in TV, but I didn't know how to shoot and edit. And so I needed to to either go spend two years at grad school or just go cover news every day. And I chose to do that. And I'm a huge uh, proponent of that. I've encouraged a few young news hour people over the year, more than a few to you know leave a big city and go do that. But that's a separate story, but always happy to talk about that. If anybody ever wants to email me, I'm happy to talk to them about that. In any event, after two years of covering politics in Iowa, moved to DC, worked on Capitol Hill covering um, the Hill for a group of out of town stations, primarily NBC stations, then went to CBS network, um, covered primarily politics again um, at CBS for a couple of years and then went to ABC for eight years, um, traveling for a year at a time on the 96 presidential campaign. Kind of every political story under the sun, a lot of congressional, senatorial, gubernatorial races, but also some oddball things like covering a, a live active volcano in Montserrat, West Indies. So real broad spectrum. But then I got a call from an old colleague I had worked with at CBS. He and Jim Lair had started a media unit and asked if I would come be the media producer. So in 2000, 20, I guess 21, 22 years ago, I started at the News Hour uh, covering the media. Um, in, in the broadest sense of the term, it's become a more popular thing to do these days. Uh, CNN has reliable sources, other things. But at the time, we were some of the few people holding media to account, looking at a whole variety of issues. Um, and then my, my correspondent retired, and Jeff Brown, Jeffrey Brown, and I merged our units, called it Media Arts and Culture. And then we just started doing a lot more arts and culture. And so that became a beat that correspondent Jeff Brown and I as the producer do together um, with you know, some other people um, being pulled in on assignments. So it's been a great partnership for a number of years. So um, you know, a kind of circuitous route, but that's um, sometimes what it takes to figure out you know, new passions. Still love politics, but this is a, a, a newer passion. Um, and happy to be here. And uh, uh, just looking at some of the photos that you shared with me earlier that I added here, I mean, you've met some pretty incredible people along the way. I see you're in Sting's apartment in here. You met Questlove. Here you are with Al Gore. And here you are just on TV doing your thing. Any memorable stories that are that you'd like to share about these photos? So um, Sting was funny because um, as is the case with big names or bold faced names as they're sometimes called, the, the bark is worse than the bite. The people are gatekeepers around uh, newsmakers, be they artists or politicians or anyone else, business figures, they will, they will make it seem as though nothing's gonna happen or it, they'll let you in the door, they're doing you a favor, but you know, keep it really short and tight. And so I would just use this as a quick story or parable for all of you that you know, if you push and you push in the right ways, you'll ultimately get what you need and what you want to, to, <laughs> to use a rock and roll term. So we showed up at Sting's apartment. I still have the schedule and I usually do pretty meticulous schedules, you know, who's coming, where, how we're doing, what we're doing, why, you know, all sorts of numbers, everything. This schedule, I think this was like almost, I don't know, 12 years ago now, essentially had an address and my cell phone number and the name of the PR person. I'm not even sure she gave me her cell phone number. She wasn't a true believer in public media and the news hour. And that's a different story. Sometimes you have to convince people. We do have a formidable audience. We do have a great voice and with opinion makers and with average people and everybody in between. Anyway, so we, we show up, he was living at Central Park West at that point. We show up at the appointed time, we wait, we bite our nails. She shows up and she's like, you're gonna, you're gonna get 15 minutes, that's it. So we go up to his apartment and we're setting up you know, fast and furiously. And he comes out and surprises us, starts talking, couldn't be nicer in the middle of a move. His wife, Trudy comes out 
um, don't worry, no rush. Can we get you any lunch? It was just so pleasant and nice. And I'm sure the PR person wasn't happy. The upshot um, is amazing interview. He has deep thoughts on many things. So yeah, at the end of the day, it was an arts piece, but that's not a just an arts piece. It was an arts piece. And that had, you know, that packed a powerful punch as we hope all of these do. And, um, you know, he's still going strong. I have immense respect for him and was very happy with the piece. Um, and one little tidbit in his apartment where they were actually packing, they had boxes just like you and me, um, packing to move to a new apartment. Uh, on a coffee table, they had um, clearly a, a subscription to Rolling Stone and all the address labels said was Sting and Trudy, Central Park West. No further names, no apartment number. And basically the postal people knew where to bring it. They knew how to get it to him. So I guess when you are that well known, um, you guard your privacy and, and protect yourselves, but you also get your mail delivery. So it was pretty, pretty wonderful all the way around. It was just, um, we made it sing, and so to speak, with a lot of music interwoven, but he had some very powerful things to say. So I, I recall that fondly. Questlove, another bright light. This is a much more recent story. This past fall, when there was that window of opportunity shooting back in person a ton before uh, Omicron, um, he had a new book out, which didn't get a ton of press. So that was our peg. But Summer Soul um, was also quite new. And so it was kind of a mixture of all the various hats he wears and um, why it is that he does what he does and how he does it. Deep thinker, this was in Harlem at the, the park um, where Summer of Soul actually happened. And um, um, the coolest, yeah, the coolest no, thing, look at it. Go sorry. ahead, sorry. No, I'm yeah, sorry, I skipped ahead head. accidentally. No, um, go ahead. Take, a, take a look at his footwear. He had on Crocs with the little kids' um, gibbets, I think, um, uh, that they put in the Crocs. So he's just whimsical and creative and funny. And you see it head to toe, quite literally, with Questlove. So that was a lot of fun. Um, the other one, Al Gore, was Al Gore. Can't say it was a knock your socks off interview, but. <laughs> um, well, you know, I was <laughs> he was, was a sitting it. vice president, so I was an ABC News producer then, and the other one, um, I was also at ABC, and I would work the overnights, um, actually a combination schedule of overnights and weekends, which is enough to kill your brain. Um, in any event, that was my schedule, and the nice part was um, at the end of the overnight, I would do these news cut-ins. Well, I was going to say, there's a nice conversation happening in the chat where we're uh, figuring out who knows all of these different uh, people of influence um, that you've spoken to. So I think it's mixed with Sting. A lot more people know Questlove, mixed with Al Gore. Um, so <laughs> it's a good conversation. But I was going to say, you mentioned something when you were talking about um, Sting that, and something that you say that I think is, is really great. It's a great takeaway about the power of a story um, like the kind that you report is that you really want to make them sing. Mm -hmm. um, and I love when you say that because one of the chat questions that we have for everybody is, um, you know, what are the elements of a compelling arts and culture story? And uh, another way to say that is like, what are the elements that can really make a story sing? So I'd love to hear from everybody here, your thoughts first about, um, what what are those elements? It could be anything from B-roll, from the sound bites. What about it uh, from a recent story that you've watched uh, make you feel like it's really powerful and that it kind of gets under your skin? Let's see what you guys have to say. And you can just, you can type full sentences or just phrases, words, anything that comes to mind right away. And I think, um, and when you have those kinds of interviews like you had with Sting, like at, does it make your job easier when it's like, oh yes, this is a great interview. I know exactly what I'm gonna be doing with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I should answer or? Well, you can uh, so feel free to start answering and then I'm, I'll take a look at the chat and then I'll, I'll chime in with some of the responses. Okay, I see time. Emmett. I think Emmett uh, wrote something. Okay, Emmett, I think the elements of a compelling story are the styles of editing, 
that the producer chooses. I absolutely love editing. What do you think of Emmett's response? Um, oh, and I see, um, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I see uh, Roberto chimed in too, sorry. And at Raven, okay, here we go, Emmett. The elements <laughs> of a compelling story, the styles of editing that the producer chooses. I absolutely love editing, well, well, well said. Um, Absolutely, and elements or building blocks are uh, really natural sound, as I told Elise, is a huge thing. I know you all have discussed it and used it. I've seen it done wonderfully in some of your pieces. Um, almost all arts pieces begin with natural sound. Um, it's sometimes hard if you don't have a two-person crew. There are some ways around that, but get the best quality sound you can because you're going to be weaving that throughout your piece. Um, and clarity of sound really helps a lot. If you close your eyes and listen to a piece, you should be able to kind of be experiencing at different levels and blocking out the visuals, that soundtrack should be almost as equally powerful as the, as the video track. Um, so, so yeah, so there's natural sound, there's if your piece is tracked, which it seems many are, not all, the, the, the reporter track um, and the sound bites. And then we talked about if you're short on video, you could be adding some really interesting graphics and not look at those as a crutch, but as an enhancement. So that, that would be included in one of the elements in your toolkit that you can lean on if you need, if you don't have adequate video or if you wanna really visually explain something that needs a little bit more explication. Um, so uh, th those are the things that taken together, woven together well, um, would make it compelling. But you know, back to your pitches, it's, it's gonna be as compelling as the people whom you choose to do the talking. And they can't just be good talkers with not a lot of substance or a lot of substance without expressing it well. It's that marriage of those two things. Um, and I saw that in, in spades in some of these pieces that people who can really express, um, but also have a lot to say, a lot of importance to say. Right. And that's what, that's what Raven said too, in her comment, mm -hmm. things that people can relate to back to their personal lives tend to affect them stronger. So, so that's absolutely right. And then Roberto said, as well as relevancy to current times and the journalist's connection to the story. So really understanding what the story is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Great responses, everybody. So now we have a an example of a piece, Anne, that you've done. Um, this was from March 2021. Um, and we're going to watch just a couple of minutes and then talk about those elements again, those tips to um, unlocking really powerful arts and culture stories. Um, so anything that we should set up with this piece, Anne, that you'd like to share? Um, it was just the timing of it. It's hard to remember, and you all have your own experiences, but this was kind of one of the first pieces I shot in person after being locked down for a little while. I was out and about a lot in DC, uh, not traveling a lot on airplanes, but shooting a lot. Then we went through a period of not being so much in person, mm -hmm. and then um, went to shoot this last spring, and it really got my juices flowing. It's just... It's a fun visual you'll, story you'll see, but there's kind of a who does who done it uh, backdrop or backstory to it, kind of a science thread uh, about the ocean currents, and just this whimsical fun art. Um, and those shoes, which aren't really shoes, pieces of art, are hugely <laughs> expensive. I found out so. Um, just a, an interesting conceptual artist. Uh, I wouldn't say he's the best talker or best advocate in the world, but I think his art carried it and he was good enough. And the the exhibit was really interesting. So I went with it and I think to decent effect, but you tell me. All right, let's take a look at the first couple of minutes. It was the great shoe spill of 1990. Do you recall? Tens of thousands of Nike shoes fell into the Pacific. It led to some scientific discoveries and now whimsical art packed with an eco-friendly message. William Brangham plunges into an exhibit called Overboard, part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. At first glance, it looks like a sneaker showroom with what seemed to be 200 Nike Air Jordans along the walls. 
a candy shop of sorts for the so-called sneakerheads who collect all manner of brands as a passion and sometimes for profit. But look more closely. These are no ordinary shoes. They're intricately sculpted replicas, fashioned out of everyday garbage, discarded boxes, bags, and posters. It's really fun to sort of um, latch yourself on to those, those graphics. And also the, 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 the brand recognition and the, the nostalgia that people feel for those brands. And again, it's, it's, it's drawing them in. Conceptual artist Andy Yoder crafted these objects following his similar eye-grabbing installations, like these massive paper airplanes aloft in the Cleveland airport, or this model of planet Earth built from 300,000 wooden matches, or these enormous shoes, seven feet long, made of licorice. For these handmade sneakers, all size 13, Yoder says each took roughly six hours to construct. And his raw materials, they often came out of garbage cans, alleyways, and dumpsters. No material was ruled out, no place off limits. He found the scraps for one shoe out behind his local Chinese restaurant. And then in the dumpster, along with these other packages, I found this jigsaw puzzle of a tiger. And wow. I just thought, that is the great combination here. So someone had done, assembled the, the puzzle right. and then chucked it. They did. Uh, right next to uh, Salvatore Ferragamo, you've got Special K Cereal or Veuve Clicquot right next to Hot Wheels. So it's that juxtaposition, that slamming together of, of things from high culture, low culture, all those different things kind of bumping up against each other. But this is about more than just a chaotic collision. Of all right. Uh, that was awesome. So would love the to next hear... part, not, not that you need yeah. to see it, but happy to share the links is about how they got there, how the tide took them, what they, what scientists learned from how the shoes dispersed, the real shoe spill, not obviously the art, but we, we twined those stories, so. And, and tell us a fun fact about left and right sneakers. Oh gosh, now you're gonna test my, my memory. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the script, you can remind me which current goes which way. Um, I'm afraid to click the script or you may not see me again, but it's in the piece. Um, Leah, you want to tell? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just I that the scientists discovered one. that the left shoe ended up one place and the yes. right shoe ended up another place. So it was like right. whatever was happening in the ocean, it was, the shape but... of the sneakers took them in different directions. That is that is absolutely correct. I can't remember which went which way is my problem a year later, but you're absolutely right. Um, and then we talked to this very old um, oceanographer um, scientist in California who explained it better to us. Um, had never, never used Skype before, and I'm sure you have encountered people like that. That was a whole um, journey in, a, in and of itself. But um, in other words, there were other voices in this piece, but Yoder, the guy you saw, the conceptual artist is the main one. But yeah, it was fun. And I'd love to hear uh, people's reaction to that story. If anybody uh, wants to unmute and to share, did you like that? What was surprising about it? Did you want to finish watching it? Was it a good teaser? Feel free to go ahead and unmute. Loved it. Maria said that she loved it. Awesome. Um, and we'll be providing the link to both the slides and all of the different pieces that we watched tonight. So you'll have them on hand. Um, well, and you kind of went over this before, but using that piece that we just watched, um, why is it important when you're producing really any story, but especially when it's about art and music and things that are super visual, uh, why is it important to keep all of these elements that we have on here in mind? Um, because they're the, the marriage or the symphony or whatever metaphor you want to use um, that, that gets you to where you want to be, which is a compelling product that you like, but also that other people, your peers, your teachers, your students who depending on your perspective, want to see, want to hear, want to uh, have a second second viewing of perhaps. Um, so I the, the part about hearing bites, um, I like to sometimes when I get a transcript and I can 
recommend a very inexpensive service. I don't know, you may use it, Trent, um, where you can get the transcript, the audio and the video all married. And sometimes what I do is I close my eyes afterwards and just listen um, to the best bites, which sometimes helps. But also in the moment, I was telling Elise and Leah earlier, if you're at an interview, you might do a, a shorter interview and get awesome bites, or you might do a really long interview and feel like you're not getting the person to say things that sound wonderful and that can stand alone. Sometimes they want to answer your question in a fragment, which is harder to write to. It's not impossible, but it's harder if there's not a discrete thought that they're putting out there that it's dependent or contingent on your question. Um, so I, tr I try to listen in the moment, you know, are they saying something that grabs me? And, and those are the kind of aha moments or epiphanies. Wow, that is, and I, and I noted them for the pieces that I screened of yours today, like, wow, that's, you know, that's a keeper. You got to incorporate that. You could even build part of the piece around it. It's so good. So the sound bites, there are people, when I used to work at CBS, um, there were people at 60 Minutes, for example, who would do nothing but put the bites they wanted in the piece in a script and then weave around that. I mean, it's a different technique. People work in different ways. I'm not saying go about that. I would follow your protocol, but that's just to, to say that bites are um, you know, so powerful that they really are kind of the pillars propping up your piece. Um, so here, you know, get in the habit of hearing bites, listen for those moments. Um, you know, don't let the interview drag on unless you need to. And I heard, I, I think you guys are all in the habit and I heard one of you um, say at the end, um, is there anything else you'd like to add, which is a marvelous question. I think that was um, maybe uh, Julie, no, William, William did that. Uh, the person interviewing William, Julia and uh, Abby. Um, because sometimes people do subconsciously hold out something and they drop it on you at the end. And that's awesome because you, you know, it, it, it may not have been expected, but it may be something you want to lead with. You, you never know what they're going to add when given that open door. Um, going in with a plan vis-a-vis -vis this particular piece, um, we didn't get far enough into the piece to show the exterior, but they put this exhibit in a, um, a container ship. So to mimic what had happened with the Nike shoes. So it was a very small, compact, uh, vertical um, space to put an exhibit in um, and, and very cool, but it, it was uh, you know, a little bit of a challenge shooting it. Um, and so that's where you know, getting really particular details on the shoes and getting JPEGs of all the works of art so that you can sometimes intercut between the full screen JPEG of a piece which is kind of a, a, an old hack, but really helps. If you have JPEGs of everything and your B-roll, then you can um, mix it up, but also you have something to resort to if for some reason your B-roll isn't close enough or you don't have the type of lens that really captures good detail. Like there was little writing and very little intricate um, art here. So go in with the plan, but be prepared to pivot. That's kind of life, right? So, you know, being flexible, I'm sure this is second nature to you all. Um, but uh, then uh, the being the fly in the wall part, I think we deduced down from something I said about getting your person in action. Like in this case, Yoder, the artist in his artist studio, which we took him across town to see him actually making the shoes you know, get out of the way, watch, um, really make sure that they are not camera conscious is what I call it. They're not looking at the camera, but also some people want to keep talking because they know you're there. They sense your presence and it looks really odd. I tell people it looks like you're talking to yourself and that usually stops them because I don't want to look like a crazy person, but tell them we're, we're here to capture it, but you know, we're going to be a flying wall. We're going to take a step back. So you get them in there um, you know, natural environment doing what they do. That's, that's what you want to show. Um, and I guess skipping around, we did talk about natural sound and graphics, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on those fronts, but these are the building blocks we talked about. Awesome. That was great. Um, and so we have our first student story. This is Julie and Abby, who you mentioned as well. 
um, having read their pitch and listened to the interviews that they've done so far for their piece. So mm -hmm. Julia and Abby, um, are you able to unmute? I'm gonna pin you as well. Yes, I can unmute. Awesome, hi Julia, let me just pin you real fast. And then Abby, I see you now. Yeah, awesome. hi, there's a bunch of screaming kids because I'm at work right now at a theater, <laughs> but, but no. um, I will happily add in where necessary. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Abby. Um, well, tell us a little bit, uh, maybe Julia, if you're able to, about your story, what it's about, and what you, um, what you hope that viewers take away with the final story. Yeah, so The Rail is this place in Michigan, and it's this little space. It's like a community space where anyone is able to go, and so you're able to do, like, crafts to, like, decompress and, like, really focus on like art therapy and like just do little crafts just to distract yourself and like it's just a space you can go to and feel better like feel more well like it's open to anyone it's free and sometimes they have workshops and like certain things revolving around mental health awesome and what uh how did you get the idea for to do the story so our teacher, um, Michael Kaufman, actually suggested it to us. Um, I think we have worked with them before. Viewspire is another um, name for their brand where they have um, a tire with like mental health sayings on it. And that's how we found out about it. That's great. Well, we're not going to be able to play uh, like the full part of your interview, but I did want to play just a tiny little, little clip so that everybody could get a sense of what your characters are like and also just appreciate the setup that you created. I mean, there's yeah. so much going on, but it's really beautiful and ties into kind of what she, this character is all about. Um, so let me just play that really quickly for everybody. So I'm Nikki O'Donnell and I am a child psychologist. Oh no, loading problems. Let's see. So I'm Nikki O'Donnell and I am a child psychologist. Darn, okay, well, we got a little taste of it. <laughs> yeah. She had me at glitter. She mentioned <laughs> use of glitter, so. Oh I'm yes. I do, this is a good one where maybe you all can explain to us um, what kind of B-roll you're going to gather, because I saw the two long interviews, but I haven't seen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. We got a lot of B-roll. There's that space is just so like creative and like artsy. We got a lot of like the crafts and just like all the decorations in there and like they display the art and it's just really creative. Like we got like. Um, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called rack focus. I don't know if Mr. Coffin told me the right word for it, but we got like the in and out focus and like the following of it and like everything just like creative beautiful shots is just like the entire space, like the entire space is just so artsy and pretty. And did you interview students as well as these um, leaders? Unfortunately, we did not get to that day, but we might be going back to interview students. Yeah, they were really the they strong interviews, very strong interviews. Thank yeah, you. they cleared they cleared out their space for us um, and made sure they didn't have anybody there. So we sent them an email today and hopefully there'll be a time that we can go back while they actually have like a workshop in progress. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And Julia and Abby, do you have any questions for Anne about how you're taking and finishing this piece? Um, I think we'll definitely need help with like voiceovering. That's always like my rough patch, like what we could say to really like hook on the viewers. Yeah, finding a good way to connect the stories. So I have one little tip there because you did such detailed and lengthy interviews. Um, when you get a transcript, you can look at parts that are just factual. They're not probably meant to be the actual sound bites, but they give you that muscle or that connective tissue to you know, give some editorial facts, to explain to people the background. So in essence, 
a lot of what you need to write your track in your piece is probably in that interview. Because you ask such thorough questions, the answers in there will turn around and be fodder or you know, provide you the, the narrative you need to stitch it all together. So it, in a way, that's a, a helpful thing. You've done the hard work. Now look for the parts of the interview because obviously you're gonna have to make some tough choices you know, what are the absolute standout bites, but what, are, what is the material that was just meant to be informative and then turn that into your, um, your narrative that you're gonna, you're writing your script with. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, you're and welcome. You mentioned, Anne, about um, tough choices with sound bites. So do you have any advice for how to narrow down between bites that you think you love and bites that could really work? How, yeah. do you, how do you cut it down? Well, the closing your eye thing works for me, but it doesn't work for all. Another technique is, I, I love Google Docs. So you put the whole thing in there and you take one pass at it, um, you know, striking through. And there are ways to time out what that comes down to in terms of running time, total running time, as we call it. Um, or you can read it and time yourself, however you choose, you know, and so you know how much more you need to cut. So I go different iterations. So I do one where I think I've cut enough, find out it's not enough, go through again and make a second, what we call paper cut. And you, you always keep a copy of your work, you know, and then cut and paste to another doc so you don't have to, to recreate the wheel. But you will find if you do that, maybe three passes, you will find there are things you thought you couldn't live without that you can live without. And so it's a it's a question of priorities, but the, the best stuff will rise to the top and you can somehow live without the other material if you go at it in stages. It's hard to you know, take a 15 minute interview or two 15 minute interviews down to the essential parts. So that's, that's one approach because you, you don't feel like you're doing it hastily and in the process of whittling like that by striking through in Google Docs, your, your mind is starting to calculate what, what are the essential pieces that need to live and what you can live without. Awesome. Um, and thank you, Julia and Abby, so much for sharing and letting us uh, see a little bit of the story that you're working on. We're actually going to skip around a little bit. We're going to go from Michigan to Austin, Texas, because um, Tish Saliani, who's here, um, her students are, uh, I guess the weather is really bad. There's a thunderstorm about to happen in Austin. So we want to make sure that we get to, um, to their piece before uh, they have to go. So Emmett, I'm going to come back to yours. And let's go to Knock and Noggins, who uh, is a piece from Alexa and Ivana at Westwood High School in Austin, Texas. Are you guys here? Please unmute and say hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> awesome. All right. So let me just pin you guys. So tell us a little bit about your story. Um, so our story is about like this artist in Austin named Leah Chima, and she's so wonderful. She, um, a few years ago, well, she's always been an artist, but a few years ago, she experienced a really bad accident on one of those like very Austin downtown scooters, um, and almost lost her life and has found a way to turn that around and turn it into a business where she really impacts the biking community, which is huge here um through her art and kind of mixes her passion for painting and drawing with safety and just being a good influence to the like huge community here in Austin so I thought she was a really perfect pick for this project and yeah she's been great awesome well um I'm gonna try and see if my internet cooperates so we could watch a, a couple of minutes of your piece. But before we do that, as I set it up, were there any challenges that you both had while you're recording this piece? And what were those challenges? Um, I would say, uh, mm, I mean, we had a few technical difficulties, um, but we really haven't run into any huge challenges other than not being able to film at her busy shows because we can't have other people so we've had to really carve out time like before she does shows um, to film just her. Um, but really, it's been pretty smooth sailing so far because um, both of our uh, subjects are just so, so good at this. 
another thing I would say is how we wanted, we really wanted to incorporate her studio. But when we got there, it was a really tiny like loft area above her living room. So the space and the lighting was very minimal. So we had to adjust a lot and we kind of couldn't uh, end up using some of the clips that we interviewed her at her loft. So we had to redo them and um, we adjusted and did we did her interview at the park. So I think that came out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, that can be a challenge sometimes with lighting. Let's watch a, a minute or so of your piece. And this is your rough cut. One in every 60 people in America live with a brain related injury on a daily basis. That's insane. Local Austin artist Leah Chima combines her passions for art, education, and athletics with her thriving small business, Knock and Noggins. Knockin' Noggins is on a mission to change how the world sees helmets through education, awareness, and rad design. And we do so by making um, custom pieces of art on a helmet that's hand-painted so people actually want to wear them. From her cozy home studio, she paints custom helmets to promote safety in the biking community and remove the stigma associated with wearing the proper gear. I picked Noggin' Noggins for my helmet because the artist, Leah Chima, is so vibrant and fun. And I also just really love what she is trying to do for um, the active community, honestly. While she'd always been an artist, it wasn't until Noggin' Noggins that she found the business in which her passions collided. August 7th of 2018, I was leaving dinner with some friends and we decided to take those little downtown scooters, those little motorized scooters home. Never been on one before. And something happened, it was a freak accident. I was behind them so nobody saw, but they heard me fall. And I woke up four days later in the shock trauma unit, spent another month in the hospital with three skull fractures, three brain bleeds. I was connected to a ventilator and in and out of a coma. So I almost didn't walk out of the hospital. And that prompted me, I had a lot of time of reflection on what my life's purpose was. And I knew it was in some way to help others be inspired by my story and to help make a change. All right, we'll stop it there, but great job, guys. This is uh, such a strong piece. Amazing B-roll um, with the helmets. And what did you think when you watched this piece? Oh, it was great, as I told you, and um, it's an issue I care something about. Um, and know people have been in serious accidents, so I think it's a really good public service topic, and she is a compelling uh, person, as is the other interviewee. Um, I thought they did a really wonderful job. I had a couple questions. The, the format, not the format, but the techniques deviated a little bit from some of the others. So I don't know if you have people look into the camera or if you want to make sure when doing interviews, people look at you, the interviewer off camera. It's not a, you know, it's not a deal breaker. It's just a technique um, for news pieces. You're looking usually off camera that people aren't talking into the camera. But that's not, a, it's not a big deal. It's just something I mentioned because I don't know how, how many people were there in person because it makes it harder uh, if it's just one of you for sure. Um, and um, music is definitely something that can enhance. It's um, kind of a double-edged sword in some ways because sometimes it becomes loopy after a while. So you have to figure out, is it enhancing or is it, distracting. I think it was a nice choice. Um, we don't use music unless it's what we call indigenous music, music from the environment in which we're shooting or filming. Um, but it's, again, it's not a yes, no, as far as I think what you all do. It's a question I have more is getting used to your format. Um, but she, I think she was strong enough to to carry it without the music, that if you heard her bike and some of the natural sounds uh, instead of the music bed, that could have been interesting as well. 
And then you had a great suggestion about um, even more B-roll that could potentially be added um, to complement the, the powerful images that they already have of the, the helmets. Yeah, it, I don't know if it's possible that she has any photos, you know, family member, loved one, someone took of her in the hospital, but to drive home just how serious her situation was and what drove her to start the business, um, it would be great if you were able to weave that in. Um, and some of the statistics she used might be something you could even graphicize with her on the screen, depending on, on how someone is positioned on a screen. If there's like a vertical column um, that is a space that's unused, you could build, you know, one out of however many she said have uh, TBIs. You know, it's just a way of visually reinforcing to people a stunning statistic. So, you know, there are some things you could do as overlays without, um, you know, not redoing the piece, but just additional elements. Um, if you have those photos of her, even recuperating at home, just to drive home how serious serious her injury was. Yvonne, um, Alex, is that something that you had been thinking about? Um, yes, actually today, after we received your feedback, we reached out to her and asked for just in general, um, more like B-roll and images of past shows. She, I don't think she's particularly comfortable, um, showing a lot of stuff from her injury. Um, so I, uh, we're respecting that, but we were able to get like, I don't know, 50 more shots, um, because we did have an issue with repeating cause there was limited footage we had. Um, but we fixed all that today and, um, it, it gives it much more variety, like you're saying. You. That's great. You know, going back again and again in the right way, um, be it interviewing and asking those questions we were talking about, and then somebody drops a bombshell on you or asking for more elements. It, it, you'll be surprised people, you know, usually someone like this aims to please, she just might not have known how much you need it. I always say that um, arts pieces sop up, uh, kind of like bread, you know, they sop up elements. And so if people are offering photos, take as many, you can always leave some on the cutting room floor, but you know, the more the merrier because you may well be able to use them. And Alexa and Ivana, do you have any questions for Anne? Um, I think that all of our questions and concerns were kind of answered in the feedback email. Um, yeah, and everything's been, we've, we've made so much progress today. Um, so yeah, I think it's going pretty well. And I don't have any, I don't know about Ivana. Yeah, I don't either. And thank you so much. I yes, think the you. feedback helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Did we talk, um, Elise, I know I was talking to you earlier and I can't remember if it was that conversation or this conversation about two focal lengths and the use of an iPhone? If oh, we haven't talked about that, but yeah, we can definitely talk about that for sure. Fine, sure. But yeah. So not particularly this piece necessarily, but any piece can benefit from multi-cam approach. And I know that sounds like, oh man, we don't have all that equipment or all those people, but something that the NewsHour has um, discovered and embraced during COVID is, um, we, we've used iPhones, you have to set them at a certain, um, rate and, and there are some technical things that I could pass on later. But in any event, shooting horizontally, and that's essential, shooting on a tripod, that's essential, is, is one way to get an extra camera if you don't have additional cameras that are exactly the same. And by setting up a second focal length, so you'd have a tight shot, and then you'd have a wider shot or kind of a side shot, you know, depending on the environment, but what any of those allows you to do is to intercut. And it's a way of pulling up interviews. So rather than having little jump cuts between um, where you're losing part of the interview, but you don't have anything covering it. So it's a little bit of a you know, jolt to the eye or to dissolve or effect of some sort, which is you know, perfectly fine, but it sometimes is, is not as pleasing. If intercut allows you to keep going back and forth and add some variety, um, but also is a nice tool if, if your uh, piece is really inter interview based where you're collapsing a long interview into um, a much shorter time. So um, if you're able to shoot two cameras, something you might wanna try, um, 
you know, many ways to utilize that second camera. And you'll probably become addicted to it because once you start doing things that way, it's like, man, you know, here's what I've been missing out on and I can't go back to the other, which of course you can, but it's, it's fun to be able to have that as an expert resource. Yeah. And I think also as a consumer of a lot of stories, you're kind of expecting that, you know, motion from different angles, different cameras, um, and less so the, of that static interview. Um, all right, well, let's jump to Emmett in Colorado, uh, who's working on an awesome piece. I have um, some screenshots pulled up here from your interviews, and Anne also had a chance to read your pitch um, and listen to some of the interviews. But Emmett, I'm going to pin you next if you're able to unmute and share a little bit more about yourself and your piece. Yeah, hi. Um, I use heat pronouns, by the way, just something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, so this piece, um, so to explain youth equity stewardship, I don't know if any of your guys' high schools have been have ever been a part of it, but around the United States, Benji and Wade, they go around and a selected um, amount of students and teachers from schools around the county get to miss out on school for the day to talk about social issues in their county, in their community. Um, it ranges from racial issues in schools, uh, LGBTQ issues, just normal school issues like like what's going on with the tech there or anything. And so they have certain topics um, and they're very specific that go on within, um, within the community. And it, they help spark conversation using um, music. So they'll perform their music for us and they'll kind of have like backstories within the music. And so I've been a part of it pre-COVID and then this year we finally brought it back. And so I was like, all right, I've been a part of this. And my teacher, Miss Hamilton brought, up, brought um, this prompt up. And so I was like, okay, I've been a part of this. Now I wanna know more about um, Benji and Wade and their inspirations with music and it's just, it's an amazing program. We're free to talk about what we want to talk about. And we also just have fun. So it's something that really sparked my interest because it mixed um, contents of music and activism within communities, which are two things I have wide knowledge on. So yeah. That's great. And uh, so you have your interviews and have you run into any challenges maybe that Anne could help out with as you're figuring out the puzzle piece of putting your story together? I think um, some challenges is one I am behind just because I did get sick last week and I'm going to have to cut down like 30 minute interviews. But um, I think those are just my main challenges is finding like picking out the things that matter the most within the story just because these interviews were so long um and i think the editing process it will take a while and i just as long as i can like meet the deadlines i'm good so yeah there were some great if i can jump in there were just some great moments i thought in the interviews um and if I get Wade and Benji reverse, let me know. But um, he was talking about his biracial story. And he said, I have two windows into the nuances. Uh, and that provides me an opportunity. And he de described it as a celebration. Um, and I just thought that was such a powerful and, and beautiful way to put it. In, in, it's not a burden. It's an opportunity. And it's... Um, he feels fortunate to have this background. I, I thought that, you know, was worthy of something to preserve and write around. I thought that was an excellent expression and soundbite. Um, uh, and then uh, I think it's Benji who said, introduce music to connect the intellectual capacity to your heart, uh, to your heart level thinking. Music is a great way to do that with equity and inclusion, another great fight. So, you know, 
each man had many, but those that was one from each that I thought were particularly, you know, worth noting that. And and I know it's hard because you did such long interviews, but if you think of that little hack or, or or tip that I mentioned earlier, some of the interview is background information. It's editorial context. And so let that then take that and put that into your script, the part that you're writing that you said, one of you said, you know, that's the part that you maybe least like. It, don't don't let it get um, don't let it intimidate you. Like all the parts are there, you just need to say, well, these are the bites, but this other information I'm going to repurpose for my narrative, for my track, for my script, um, whichever term you all use. So it's it's just a matter of thinking, maybe compartmentalizing some of this, and kind of lassoing um, these large interviews, but. But I think it's all there. I think you just need to parse out what what goes where. Okay. And I have one little um, not not a not a bad thing, but just something to keep in mind: backlighting, because um, it was hard with the window there, um, and um, you know you can see them well. It's it's not a it's not a huge deal, but if you can avoid shooting into the window, I think you'll ultimately be better off. Because depending on someone's complexion, it can end up being hard because you could end up with, um, you know, somebody looking like they're in the FBI protection program. But that didn't happen here, thankfully. You must have had good lights on them. But try to avoid the window when possible, an open window. All right. Nicely done, though. Some You have good component parts. So I look forward to seeing the actual piece. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmett. And dare I say, Anne, can we share your contact info with all the students who have shared here today. Sure. You yeah, absolutely. More versions of their pieces. Mm -hmm. It can get up to news hour quality, <laughs> maybe. It can get sure, on the news whatever, hour. Whatever works. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, lastly, um, well, we're running out of time, so I want to be sensitive to everybody's schedules, uh, but I want to also make sure that we get a chance to hear from Raven, who has a great story to share. Um, so if you're able to stick around, awesome. If you're not able to stick around, thank you so much for being here. I'll be sharing the recording with um, our Connected Educator listserv. And we're looking forward to seeing all of your stories in just the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, but if, again, if you can stick around, please do. So now we're going to go to um, Raven. Oops. I'm back. It was the song. Sorry, guys. Um, to Raven at Rockville High School in Maryland. So jumping from Colorado to Maryland. Um, so if you are able to unmute Raven. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me put a pin on you. Um, okay, so here we are uh, with your story. Wow. Tell us a little bit about what you're producing. Um, so when my teacher first, pitched this, you know, piece out to my class, I immediately thought of this girl, Annie Knotts, who I've known for years, and she makes a lot of art, like, about, um, like, she makes art about a lot of different things, but I wanted to focus specifically on, like, women and, like, their bodies and just female empowerment, because I've seen a lot of that from her, and so that is what I made my piece on. Let's watch a minute or so of it. Um, it's really, really powerful. I was taking a look at it earlier today. If I can just exit this, here we go. Uh, okay, so we have yours right here. Self-expression. Humans sorry. have been- It's the one- Art is prior, a beautiful right? and unique- The puberty uh, one? I think it's this one, right, Raven? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Art is a beautiful and unique form of self-expression. Humans have been making art for as long as we have existed, and in today's climate, the voices of our youth remain particularly strong. Student Annie Knotts uses art to focus on issues important to her, issues specifically targeted around women and society. My name is Annie Knotts. I'm a senior at Rockville High School and I'm an art student. From what my parents told me, I started drawing when I was like three. The first drawing I made was while I was like sitting in the doorway while my parents were um, getting ready for work. For the first like 
14 years of my life, I was mostly self-taught, and I just kind of compared myself from yesterday. Growing up, I remember when it hit sixth grade, um, I started going through puberty and like getting my period, having to wear bras and stuff like that. And I remember feeling like an immense amount of like shame around everything. And I just remember being like ridiculed and like just constantly like scrutinized for being a girl. I just wanted to make this type of art so like other girls didn't have to feel that way. I wanted to focus on um, stretch marks for this one. Where the stretch marks are, I cut away paper and then put gold behind it. The message is just that like stretch marks are beautiful and the title of this one was Gilded Stripes, which I kind of like equated um, stretch marks to like tiger stripes. The term like a tiger earns its stripes because like when people get stretch marks it's like because you've had a baby or like you're like just doing life and they're there to show for it all right um so super powerful uh and what did you think when you watched the piece well i i think i told you right when we logged on and you and i were the only ones on i just thought that the art was really powerful and the piece raven really powerful you also have a very nice tracking voice i mean um, I was really impressed. Um, yeah, I, I thought the low angle shot of the stretch marks was really effective, a nice way to kind of elongate the art without being on top of it or just the traditional shot. It was, that was a good move. Um, yeah, I, I thought she expressed herself really well. I loved the little kid uh, drawings that her parents or she kept, um, really powerful. Thank you. Yeah, no, nice work. And I guess, Raven, what are the challenges that you're facing as you're finishing the piece? Um, a challenge for me is just that, like, I don't know what to put on top of, like, what she's saying, more specifically towards the end. I, but, um, yeah, I don't know. My, a, a recommendation that my teacher gave me is, like, when she's talking about like what her art means to her is just to put, cause she posts her stuff on social media. It was just to put like some of the comments she's gotten from that. But mm. something I was just kind of struggling with is like B-roll and like what to put on top of her talking. Did you use all that she's uh, done so far? Could she take, uh, I don't know how, where you are geographically, if, or if you're at the same school, could you go take more skills and put moves on them or can she send you some jpegs and then you could put some of you know some moves on them yourself or if you don't get to go back and actually film more yeah I, I i could do that um yeah i can do either i also like the social media idea you can actually do a scroll you know her instagram account or something you know scroll down and show the popularity and the feedback, if, if that's something you want to do. I mean, it, it is a way to show that she's catching on. I don't want that to reflect her value. I think the value is there. She doesn't need that affirmation. But if, if it's something that makes sense, I, I think that was a good suggestion. Um, another thing, there's a part that I, I didn't include where she says that um, her parents were like very supportive of her. Would you suggest that I put that there and then also interview her parents or would that be too much? I think that's subjective. Your colleagues here may have other thoughts. Um, I think it can stand alone. I don't know if you have a certain running time um, that you're supposed to you know, confine this to. I, I would love hearing from her parents. Um, one way to kind of keep it economical in terms of trying to accommodate their voices is to put them side by side because often people play off each other and one bite of the two of them kind of interacting might be shorter than just interviewing them separately and then trying to then feeling obliged in some fashion, which you shouldn't, but taking people's time, you, you would then want to try to incorporate them and you might find it's unwieldy. It just may be too much. So maybe doing them side by side you could get some reaction. Um, but I still think she's the star of the show. And I, 
I think that's, she's powerful as she is. She's not, you know, a, a effusive talker, but she's very, um, I was, I was really following her because her work is so intense and she is, is really invested in it. So it had a quiet attraction to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Raven, for sharing your story. Uh, and thank you everybody who's still here. Um, that I think concludes the end of the official presentation.